All right, guys, Murph's here. And today, we're gonna to be talking about the third part of my Hone Defense Shotgun series, which is going to be ammunition selection. Now, go to, going to go ahead and insert a couple of my standard disclaimers for these videos. First off, I am not a lawyer or any other type of legal authority. So with that being the case, you need to make sure that you check on your local laws and county ordinances and all that kind of stuff to make sure that you are fully aware of what all is required of you as an armed citizen and what you are capable of doing and not capable of doing in self-defense type scenarios. It's a very important aspect of this. What is legal in my jurisdiction may not necessarily be legal in yours. So, I really can't speak to what may or may not apply to you because we are talking about a very wide audience overall on this subject. So make sure you consult that beforehand. Now, in addition to that, I need to make a couple of things very clear as I have as a standard in all of my videos thus far. I am in no way some sort of tactical cool guy or even a certified instructor. I'm just a dude who's been thinking about this stuff for years and has put a lot of time and effort into the thought and selection of the equipment that I use for home defense. Apparently less so on my kitchen knives that I use for cutting lim uh, limes though. Hmm. Something I probably ought to think about a little bit more in the future. Now, in addition to that, this is at this point a three-part series. However, you do not have to watch all three parts in order to be able to know what it is that is going on in this series. Any of these videos are effectively standalone videos all by themselves. So, if you happen to find this information interesting to you, I would invite you to go check out the other videos. If you're spending a lot of time thinking about or being concerned with your personal defense in your home, then I invite you to go check out those other videos. Or if you're just curious about some other thoughts and ideas that I put out across this to maybe apply to situations or systems that you're already using for home defense, I invite you to check out those other videos. Now, now that we've gotten the disclaimers out of the way and I've managed to work myself up a little beverage for the ride. Let's go ahead and let's delve into the information. Now, there are a ton of different shotgun shells out of the market, especially if you're talking about 12 gauge, but not even just limited to 12 gauge. And all of them, 99% of them have an application in self-defense. Now, a lot of it has to do with how you're applying them. It's the same as the weapon systems that you select. If you select a sporting type arm, which by the way, is probably gonna run sporting type ammunition better, you may be a little bit diminished in the self-defense situation outside of very specific settings. We discussed that in previous videos as well. However, there are a lot of options that are absolutely optimized for self-defense and then some other options that are complete garbage. And we're going to talk about all of those in equal measure as we move forward. So starting off with that. Oh, that came out excellent. And a little strong. You, might, you guys might just be watching me get drunk here. All right. So let's talk about Aguila mini shells. Now, if you haven't heard, Aguila mini shells are shotgun shells that are about one and a half, one and three quarter inches long. I don't remember exactly how many. They're shorter than a two and three quarter inch shell. And any time that you hear Aquila mini shells really exalted as being this fantastic self-defense type cartridge, you hear two lines of thought on it. Now the first one, and the first one that I encountered many years ago was a fella said that he liked to keep it loaded in his 12 gauge so that his more lightly built wife could handle the recoil and still use the shotgun for home defense. That could be a possibility, but now keep in mind, Aguila mini shells are built around the 12 gauge and are made in either slugs or buckshot. That may be the case that you have less recoil, but as I've mentioned before, in shotguns, we are slaves to physics. So by having diminished recoil, diminished power, it's going to mean diminished downrange effect. Now, 
That also, with that diminished power, is also going to be diminished propellant and stuff like that, which means that it may not function as efficiently in semi-automatic shotguns. It's not even a may. It's not going to function efficiently in semi-automatic shotguns. It's not even worth trying. In my own opinion, maybe there's someone out there who's managed to ring off an entire magazine from semi-automatic shotgun with the Gila mini shells, but I, I really doubt it. Now, the other pitch that I hear for it is very much so a pitch. It's the sales pitch from gun shops that'll tell you that you can fit so many more Aguila mini shells into a standard magazine tube, which means that you have that many more rounds to be able to go through in a gunfight. They will especially combine that with attempted sales of the kel KSG shotgun. Now, if you don't know, and this is not a kel review by any means, but if you don't know, the KSG has two magazine tubes located um, above the barrel that are still loaded in a similar fashion to any standard shotgun, just the loading port is in the rear of the gun instead of in front of the trigger guard. And each one of those tubes holds seven rounds. Well, it would hold more than that in a Gila. I think it's like eight or nine rounds of Aguila mini shells, something like that. Regardless, you wind up with near 20 rounds uh, with one in the chamber whenever you use Aguila mini shells with the kel KSG. The problem is, though, is that I, from my own personal observation, have found that the kel KSG is very finicky on function with two and three quarter inch shells. There seems to be a special dynamic you have to run whenever you rack that shotgun. You can't be too fast, but you can't be too slow. A dynamic shared by many shotguns in the world, honestly. Some guns can, some shotguns can be very finicky, but I've noticed it especially profoundly in the kel -Tec. Now, in addition to that, the kel seems to really like to choke on Aguila mini shells. Now, why is that? And it's not just the kel -Tec. This is not just an issue limited to the kel KSG. Now, I'm no engineer. I'm most definitely not that intelligent. However, I can tell you that when you're designing systems, there's a lot of things that go into effect. Spring tensions, distances traveled, measurements uh, of all kinds are very, very important. Now, the vast majority of your shotguns on the market currently will say that they are chambered for three inch and shorter. A lot of them will say two and three quarter inch and they might even say shorter. Now, when they say two and three quarter inch and shorter, these are generally older guns and they're referencing two and a half inch shells which aren't even on the market anymore. So, Imagine what, how that dynamic changes when you insert a, an Aguila mini shell. Here's the problem. There's going to be a lot of extra space whenever you're using an Aguila mini shell. That means as that shell comes out of the tube into or onto the lifter, it's going to have extra travel. You know, it may not go all the way to the rear of the lifter. It may stop short of that. And then it's going to pop up and get in line with the bolt, which it needs to do so properly. Now, in the normal travel two or three quarter inch shell, that would be a self-regulating type process. Even if it didn't properly combine with the bolt face initially, as the bolt moves forward, it's going to get caught underneath the extractor and then everything's going to go well as you chamber up the shotgun. However, now that we have additional space with a shorter shell, we potentially defeat that process and cause malfunctions. I've seen a lot of hard malfunctions in the kel KSG with Aguila mini shells. And I know the problem is not just limited to the kel because I've even seen homespun compatibility charts for people who are really big on trying to make their sales of Aguila mini shells. I don't know about you, but that does not fill me with confidence for the system. And for the cartridge specifically, kel KSG is a completely separate review. The cartridge itself, that's not encouraging. So my personal recommendation is to avoid mini shells right off the bat those no good now going into more conventional shells let's talk about two and three quarter inch shells now the two and three quarter inch in a 12 gauge and pretty much every other cartridge is your money maker that's where you're going to find the vast majority of your options now in a 12 gauge there are there's not a single cartridge in the world with more options than a 12 gauge at all 20 gauge comes pretty close, but there is nothing else that matches the number of options that you have in a two and three quarter inch 12 gauge. However, I would like to go ahead and focus in across all shotgun shells, target loads, what is referred to as low brass. Now, low brass cartridges, the, your, your target loads are generally very small shot, like seven to eight shot. 
and very relatively slow velocities, at least in the shotgun world. You can get some fairly fast target loads, but for the most part, we're, we're talking about the lower end of velocities. A lot of people will tell you, do not use target loads for self-defense. And in specific circumstances, I mostly agree. If I was a police officer, I have no business using target loads on my day-to-day -day patrol. That's a terrible idea. If I was worried about threats outside of my home, say as a truck gun or even defending against um, a, a crowd of ne'er-do-wells, I would not want to use birdshot. That is not going to be advantageous to me. However, if we're talking about single-digit feet engagements, I'm completely fine with running target loads and do in several of my shotguns. That is, that is not beyond me to do so. What I like about running birdshot is I diminish an overpenetration characteristic found from a lot of your more defensive-minded loads in most firearms, but also in shotguns. Even if I do manage to somehow completely penetrate my opponent's body with target loads, which is a big if, they're not going to travel much further, and they're not going to travel with enough energy to actually hurt anybody. Should I shoot a wall, I'm not going to have a massive overpenetration issue. Now, as I said before, but bears repeating, this is for single-digit feet engagement type circumstances, which is where I wind up utilizing my shotguns as it is. I use shotguns to control access points, and we're talking about very close-range conflict at that point. If you're expecting to shoot any further than just a couple of feet, you need to look at a different option. That's, that's just how the physics of this plays out. Now, moving from target loads, let's go ahead and talk about hunting loads, which are generally characterized as high brass ammunition. Now, hunting loads generally come in heavier shot loads, this is also going to be your entry into things like some light turkey loads and then also a lot of waterfowl type loads, so steel shot. And again, we're talking about six to Bs and T, uh, BBs and Ts and all that kind of stuff. Heavier bird shot type loads meant for hunting, hunting at extended ranges, being able to make ethical kills on birds out to 45 yards-ish, depending, always depending. And to me, if low brass Target loads are acceptable because at close range they're going to do their work and not have an overpenetration capability. Then these cartridges are just as viable for that same purpose. Now again, this is my own interpretation of things. This is something that you should definitely look up on your own. However, keep a couple of things in mind. As always, whenever we talk about shotguns, we are talking about generally a a cloud of shot, an ever expanding cloud of shot. What's important to remember is that it's not the movies. I don't point a shotgun in a certain direction and just destroy everything in its path. That's not how shotguns work. At close range, that cloud of shot is still very tightly packed. In fact, it, it's not outside of the realm of possibility to expect that your shot pattern at 21 feet or 7 yards would be about 7 inches across. That's at 7 yards. Now imagine if we're having engagements within the the length of a room, that's well below seven yards. It's 42 feet across my house. So there's a very good possibility that I would still have a, well, let's call it six feet or two yards. I could very well have basically a very large slug traveling down range. That's why this type of shot is still very effective for what it is that I'm using it for, which is close range home defense type options. Now, also what gets introduced in the two and three quarter inch high brass loadings are buckshot and slugs. Now, in the two and three quarter inch loadings of buckshot and slugs, this is, in my opinion, the best dynamic for personal defense capable cartridges to, to distance. You know, when we start talking about buckshot out of a two and three quarter inch load, we could conceivably reach out to 50 yards and a two and three quarter inch slug would reliably kill out to a hundred as long as you could actually line up your sights on it. So this is a really good combination of good downrange effect and, and stopping power, whatever that means. It, it's good terminal ballistics and all that kind of stuff, actual energy being transferred into a target at also 
a very good trade-off in recoil to where follow-up shots will still be fairly quick and you can stand to take those follow-up shots. It's a very important dynamic in a 12 gauge shotgun. Now, double lot buck in a two and three quarter inch shell would be like eight to nine 32 caliber round balls. So you're basically unloading the magazine of a 32 caliber with one shot of 12 gauge buckshot. However, the problem becomes is that you can run into an over penetration type situation with buckshot and slugs for that matter. If you're within range of slugs, you're within range of over penetration when it comes to shooting someone with them. However, there are a couple of things that you can do that are still larger than your average bird shot that will change your over penetration dynamic. And that would be triple or number four buckshot. Now triple or number four buckshot in a 12 gauge may still over penetrate a body. And it will definitely over penetrate drywall. So if you're concerned about shooting your family members, that's something to keep in mind. However, if you switch down to a 20 gauge with number four buckshot, that over penetration issue in humans and drywall starts to go to your favor to where you're probably looking more at maybe potential injury with an over penetration through drywall as opposed to death with an over penetration through drywall. Just a, a dynamic to keep in mind and it definitely bears a lot of additional research on your own. Personal research if you can afford it. If you have a little bit of land and you can set up some drywall and shoot through it with different loads, that would be very advantageous in this case. Now that's pretty much all I want to beat up on with, uh, excuse me, with uh, two and three quarter inch shells. Now let's talk about three inch. So three inch is going to be pretty much solely covered by hunting loads. There's, there's not going to be a lot of target three inch loads. So you're talking about all high brass shells. And Three inch is where you're gonna find a lot of your, you'll find buck, you'll find slugs, you'll also find heavier loaded uh, waterfowl and turkey loads. So let's talk about these as we go. The waterfowl and turkey loads, especially turkey loads, that's some very fast moving shot in terms of shotguns, which in general are pretty low velocity, low pressure rounds to begin with. However, when you start going to that three inch turkey shot, that's fast. And you're still going to have a diminished over penetration issue with some really good penetration at close range on soft human targets. Keep in mind, guys, every year, turkey hunters kill each other out in the woods with turkey shot. It, it happens a lot. You could definitely use this effectively for home defense and not over penetrate your house or apartment and kill the neighbors. Same with turkey, or excuse me, same with duck loads, though they're not quite as fast. You can probably find some out there, just as a general rule, they're not quite as fast, but they will be heavier shot than what I've commonly found in turkey loads. Now, buckshot and slugs, you're starting to get a heavier recoil dynamic with those loads, which may affect your follow up shots. To And I also don't think you gain that much in your actual terminal ballistics on targets within the actual engagement distance of these weapon systems. Like, yeah, you can push three inch buckshot out a little bit further, but do you need to? You're still engaging a man-sized target in this case. Why do you need to push out a little bit further? Same with a slug. I, I really wouldn't be very comfortable taking a shot with a three inch 12 gauge slug over a hundred, any slug over a hundred. So what is the three inch doing that the two and three quarters not on a man-sized target at 100? It's, it's really nothing, there's no real advantage and all I'm getting is additional recoil. That's where that dynamic starts to not make sense. This, this trade-off is, is not present, it's not, it does not compute. Now going into three and a half shells, which three and a half inch shells, which pretty much leaves us entirely talking about the 12 gauge because nothing else chambers a three and a half inch shell, you're looking at a lot of your long range bird type cartridges now, though you can get three and a half inch buckshot. So you're talking about waterfowl and turkey loads and they are moving fast with a lot of shot and fairly heavy in the case of duck loads and stuff like that. Again, it's still bird shot. You're going to have an excellent trade-off between penetration and soft targets versus performance against like drywall. However, I would say pretty much solidly for everything in the three and a half inch loading, you have met a point of diminishing return when it comes to recoil. 
So yes, you have a ton of downrange power, but you're still projecting that power over a very short distance and you're not getting that much additional performance out of it versus the recoil that you have coming back at you, beating you up, potentially slowing down your follow-up shots, or maybe even making your groggy mind a little gun shy and potentially pulling a shot and putting it into the kitchen cabinets instead of your target. Just, just something to consider there. I would much prefer the two and three quarter range of options moving into the three inch range when it comes to turkey and waterfowl type shot. That's, that's how I think about that. That's how I, I kind of cross that dynamic there. Now, at this point, let's go ahead and let's talk about a lot of your gimmicky loads out there. And first, we're going to take a solid look at the 410 because we haven't really discussed the 410 yet. Because of the introduction of the Taurus Judge and the Smith & Wesson Governor, there's been this resurgence of interest in the 410 cartridge in the past couple of years. And you've seen manufacturers, specifically Hornady, come up with a lot of these very trendy different combination loads that are supposed to be optimized to work in a, in a Smith & Wesson Governor or Taurus Judge, but could also be run through your conventional pump action 410 shotgun or, or whatever type of 410 shotgun you have lying around. Now, this is not to say anything that the 410 can't do what it's supposed to do. If you load up a 410 with a piece of ammunition that, or a round of ammunition that actually works, 410 is going to work just fine for you. It's still a very powerful option to use. However, there's a lot of really gimmicky ammunition on the market. So let's talk about the not so effective 410 loads first. So that's pretty much the entire Hornady critical defense line in 410. They have a couple of combination offers. There's one that's like two balls of triple op buck behind a 41 caliber soft lead slug. I was recently looking at well, we'll go ahead and we'll talk about ammunition results here in a little bit. So they have that loading, then they have another load that is a slug with two flat discs behind it surrounded by BB sized uh, 410 shot. Yep, that's an option. That's a thing that you can do. And then they also have a loading that is just a whole bunch of those flat discs. And when I say flat discs, I mean we're talking about like like dime sized discs loaded in like really thick like if you could think about the thickness of a watch battery but the size of a dime loaded into a shotgun shell that's what we're talking about there when I talk about these discs and they'll stack like four or five of them in there these are the the trendy neato rounds for the 410 and having done research on them the results are pretty much all the same the ammunition can be accurate specifically uh, the ones involving the slug can be accurate however you get wildly different penetration distances the most consistent have been across using it in actual shotguns as opposed to the governor and the judge but you're it's it is very inconsistent and expansion is almost not at all with that soft lead bullet there's uh, out of five rounds, out of one picture I saw, there were two that had, well, one had minor mushrooming and the other one just kind of like lightly came apart. It didn't exactly mushroom, but it didn't exactly like disintegrate either. It, it just kind of, just the front end of it kind of tore up a little bit and deformed, but it, it by no means did what you would expect a hollow point round to do, which is what that's supposed to be, a soft lead hollow point. That, it did nothing. Also, all of the information out there on those those discs that I was talking about indicate that they do not penetrate worth anything. We're talking single digit inches of penetration. And keep in mind, guys, by FBI Bliss gel testing, a a the minimum effect for any round is supposed to be 12 inches. When we're talking about using long arms, shotguns specifically, we shouldn't even need to hope that we're gonna see 12 inches. That should not even be a thought in our mind. We should be trying to figure out how how much of an over-penetration characteristic we're gonna have. That should be our concern. We shouldn't be worried about the minimum side of things. So I would ultimately stay away from those gimmicky rounds. Now also, a lot of those triple-ot buck 
balls that are in there are not coated. So they're actually soft lead and they deform a little bit. Not enough to not enough to explain why things are going poorly, but not enough to, to change that dynamic either. It's for the good or the bad, I guess you could say. Now, plated regular triple op buck is a completely effective 410 loading. Uh, and also a normal 410 slug is a completely effective loading. That's simple. You just need simple solutions in this case. You don't need weird gimmicky combo rounds. Those never work out. It's not even worth the effort. Now, now let's talk about a lot of that stuff that you find at gun, sh at gun shows. So I'm talking about like Dragon's Breath and Bolo Rounds and all that kind of stuff. A lot of your flechette loadings and stuff like that. Look, if it comes in a blister pack, don't trust it. How about that? If it, if it looks like something that would have come out of like the dollar store packaging wise, it's it's not worth your time, okay? Bullets should not come packaged like toothbrushes. So let that go ahead and be your first red flag. In addition to that, now this is this is quite the rabbit hole to go down and I don't want to go too deep into it because there's just there's so many arguments and counterarguments out there and legal precedents and this, that, and the other thing. But keep in mind that if you're involved in a self-defense shooting, everything you've ever done or said on social media is going to come out. Every, it's it's going to be laid out for the world to check out. These videos that I'm doing now, if ever I have to get into a self-defense type scenario, these are going to be used or attempted to be used against me by whoever. That also comes down to your firearm and am ammunition choices. Now, there are a ton of magazine articles and YouTube videos out there that tell you you should pick your ammunition based off of this, or you should pick your firearm based off of this, or you should only run this load because of these reasons. You can delve into that, what it's come down to me is I try to pick options that are not going to overpenetrate. So at the very least, the only person that I engage with my bullets is the person I intended to engage with my bullets. That's just the decision I've made. And that's what you guys have to do is you have to decide where's the line you're going to draw. What is the, the criteria that you want to use to be able to make your decisions and just run through with that. However, as you do that, I would avoid gimmicky things that look like they're super brutal and like, Oh yeah, that'd be a really mean thing to get shot with. If you're using, if you're starting to use words like that, imagine them being turned against you, especially when it comes to like Dragon's Breath. Because if you don't know, Dragon's Breath is a shotgun shell loaded up with like magnesium chips or something, and it shoots out this ball of flame. So, if scorched earth is what you're looking for in your home defense concept, if I burn my house down, then no one can steal any of my things. I mean, I guess that works, but I can tell you right now, if you set the bad guy on fire, he's no longer the bad guy. Everyone's going to be way more concerned about the fact that you set that guy on fire. Just throwing that out there. He could have been a convicted rapist, but everyone's going to be a lot more interested in the fact that you set him on fire. Or at least some people are. I mean, I, I, I get it. I don't like rapists either. But when you, you know, you're, if you're in an anti-gun state and you set a guy on fire, no matter what it is that he's done, someone's going to be really upset about it. And for good reason, because it's, I mean, dang. Wow. Now, and the bolo rounds are the same kind of deal. When you start causing what somebody could construe as undue suffering on somebody else, ah, uh, God, it's, it's just, it's not even a worthwhile conversation to go down. Stay away from blister pack am ammunition is the end state here, all right? If it's on that random, really weird table in the back corner of the gun, sh uh, gun show with like a whole bunch of really crappy samurai swords and stuff like that, and then a whole bunch of this gimmicky blister pack ammunition, avoid it. Just avoid it. Go by, take a look, have a chuckle, keep walking. Now, let's go ahead and talk about less than lethal loads. And this is a very important distinction. Any of these loads are less than lethal. There is no such thing as a non-lethal load. Now, this, just like the gimmicky ammunition, kind of runs into a like a self-defense concept type aspect that I don't really want to delve into right now because that's a completely different video. But keep in mind a couple of things whenever we look at this ammunition. Just because you're using less than lethal ammo doesn't mean that you can't kill somebody with it. Now, what all constitutes less than lethal ammo? Well, at the one end of the spectrum, we have like rock salt, which is probably going to be pretty hard to kill somebody with, but you could cause grave bodily injury, like blinding, uh, which 
could definitely turn this into an issue because keep in mind, guys, it's not even just legal aspect, of, like criminal charges that we're worried about in a self-defense shooting. If you're in a home defense type situation, depending on you know what your pre-planning involved and you know making good conscious decisions on what it is you're going to do and a good understanding of your local laws, you could probably wind up with no criminal charges. However, that does not free you from civil charges from, say, dude's family. In addition to that, in addition to dude's family being very upset, when it comes to civil court, the finding of not guilty of criminal matters by the police plays no bearing in the outcome of civil action. So keep that in mind as far as, as when we talk about at least self-defense type things. Now, going from rock salt, we start to talk about like rubber bullets and bead bag rounds, which kind of makes up like the rest of this, uh, this less than lethal option. And you can most definitely kill somebody with that ammunition. If you hit them in the wrong place, I mean, even just breaking bones and stuff like that, you don't, you don't, you know, you break somebody's rib and it comes back and deflates a lung and they, they wind up dying on you. That, that could be a major issue. So keep in mind, just because you're using less than lethal ammunition does not mean that you're never going to kill anybody with it. Case in point, buddy of mine, uh, I knew a couple of years ago, long before I met him, he was a uh, prison guard and they were all loaded up with a with less than lethal loads in their weapons whenever they would do patrol. Well, one day, some guy just decided he had enough and he was he attempted to jump the gate. He wound up in that walk space between the internal and external gates coming right at my buddy. He just My buddy said that he just had this look in his eye like he was gonna come right through him. So my buddy came up with his less than lethal weapon loaded up and fired at point blank. This guy was coming right in on him. And he actually wound up killing this guy because that the wadding of his less than lethal round went right below the dude's eye into his brain and killed him on the spot. It was the less than lethal round. Now he was, it was, it was adjudicated as a justified shoot, but he had no intention of killing that guy. He was loaded up with a less than lethal round. That guy was supposed to be able to walk away from that, and he did not. So keep that in mind whenever you, you pick these less than lethal rounds and you think that you're doing the world a big favor. You may not be. Now, going from that, let's go ahead and talk about a couple of concepts that are out there for how to load up your shotgun that I really don't care for. I'm a really big fan of simple, streamlined systems. All right, Diminishing the amount of thought that I have to put into my weapon system when I'm under duress and a lot of my fine motor skills and logical thought processes have left me, or potentially have left me. So... And there's there's no amount of like stress shoots or stress inoculation that you can go through. There are plenty of times where I, in one scenario I have been stone cold, completely set, ready to go, and in another scenario I felt like I have fumbled my entire way through it. Stress is finicky like that, all right? So don't think that you're going to be stone cold the entire time that you do this type of stuff. You could wind up off balance very quickly and fumbling and you need to streamline as much as you can. So that's why I don't like concepts like progressive load. Now what is progressive load? So a lot of guys like to advocate for progressive load like let's say they start off with uh, rock salt and then after rock salt and their magazine tube mind you they go rock salt, bird shot, buckshot, slug and the idea is that they are upping their engagement process. It's like ROE in a magazine tube. I can tell you right now ROE should not be in your magazine tube. In my own personal opinion, once you apply a weapon, you're applying a weapon. And you need that weapon to do weapon things. You don't need it to be uh, an invitation to stop. It needs to be a, we are stopping now. That's getting a little bit in the mindset and I'm, I'm trying to avoid that conversation because this is already a long video and I don't want it to go much longer. So, What I find, where I take issue with progressive load is what if the situation evolves faster than your discharging of your magazine? So let's say you figure out there's a dude in your house. You grab your progressive loaded pump action and you rack that rock salt into the chamber. And you come out and dude, you know, you come out to, to clear the house and make sure that it's not like your drunk cousin or something like that. And dude sees you and dude starts shooting at you. Your response to lethal force is now less than lethal force. 
because I know myself, I'm gonna go ahead and fire the round in the chamber because at least the round in the chamber is better than nothing. But I'm peppering a guy with rock salt who's trying to skewer me with a nine mil. We are, he has me at a disadvantage right now and I'm not okay with that. I don't like being on my back foot. The other option would be that I had the presence of mind to rack out the rock salt and rack in the birdshot or maybe this guy is outside the house when this altercation goes down so now oh no he's outside of birdshot range i have to have this thought that he's outside of birdshot range or i'm going to ineffectively pepper him with birdshot so i rack out that round and now i'm bringing buckshot or a slug to bear that's entirely too much thought or that's entirely too much of a progression through less than effective measures as i'm trying to save my life at this point and end the fight I don't know about the rest of you, that doesn't sit well with me. That is way too much thought, that is entirely too much of reactionary type measures. And I don't, the first person, and mm, man, fighting concepts. In a fight, the vast majority of the time, the first person to violence is the winner. Now here's the problem in a self-defense type measure is you don't get to choose to be the first person to violence. So the sooner you realize you're in a fight, the better. I swear, this is the only little bit we're going to talk about for fighting mindset. The sooner you realize in the fight, you're in the fight, the better. Which means that you have a better opportunity to be able to come out on top in this fight. I do not want to have to work against my ammunition to be able to come out on top in the fight. Now, there's another idea out there getting, getting off of that style of progressive load for alternating load, which would be to alternate between buckshot and slugs. I think that has a lot more application in a police type setting than it does in a home defense type setting because... To me, all that sounds like is I'm alternating between some massive overpenetration issues. However, I would prefer that to loading some sort of diminished load like uh, rock salt or rubber bullets or something like that. So out of that continuum, if you have to go with some sort of mixed load in your shotgun, I would like to see you do alternating load with actual man stoppers as opposed to some sort of less than lethal. Now, another option, if you are wanting to have available options on your shotgun, which makes a lot of sense, you have that capability, you could have your magazine loaded up with, say, buckshot, and then have a shell carrier running down the side of the receiver with maybe half of it filled with buckshot facing one direction and the other half filled with slugs facing the other direction. That's actually a very commonly taught practice and I think that has a lot of merit. There's a lot of advantages to that that would actually make it really effective in a home defense type scenario. It would keep things very streamlined and very easy to work around with a modicum of thought. There's still a lot of thought and manipulation involved, but it's way less than trying to remember where your actual fight stopping loads are in a progressive load type setup. That's, that's purely my opinion on that one, guys. Don't you know, spend some time thinking about this. Go check out some other guys on YouTube and see what it is that they have to say. Read some articles on this matter and see what people who have, you know, gone through training and stuff like that have to say. And then also, I don't know, maybe go get the training yourself and see what a guy actually certified to teach this subject has to say. But for the moment, that's what I have to say. So I'm going to go ahead and finish the rest of this and catch you guys later.